Spirit of power, anoint me for service. Do we need his anointing spirit? Can't we just do it ourselves? You can. That'll be the difference between being an entertainer or ministering to people. 265, let's stand. Spirit of power, anoint me for service. Spirit of holiness, cleanse thou my heart. Give to my soul of thyself a new vision and a new measure of power impart. Fill me with power for service and use me. Is there not some work my weak hands can do? Make me a channel of life and of blessing, and with the Spirit anoint me anew. Many are winning lost souls for the kingdom, while of my life much is fruitless and waste. Great is their joy for the jewels in gathered. May not my soul of this joy have a taste. Fill me with power for service and use me. Is there not some work my weak hands can do? Make me a blimple of life and of blessing, and with the Spirit anoint me anew. Never before has my soul had such yearning for thy infilling, O Spirit of love. Come to my throne, be my master and ruler. Reign now and draw my affections above. Fill me with power for service and use me. Is there not some work my weak hands can do? Make me a channel of life and of blessing, and with the Spirit anoint me anew. Myself I yield in complete consecration, body and spirit and soul to be thine. Spirit of power, regard thou my yearnings, and fill thou me with thy fullness divine. Fill me with power for service and use me. Is there not some work my weak hands can do? Make me a channel of life and of blessing. And with the Spirit anoint me anew. Father, we're thankful that you're a God that can meet our needs. And Father, sometimes we have yearnings that are not right, they're not proper, they're sinful. But sometimes, Lord, there are yearnings of heart that need to be, need you to speak to us, need your voice, need to know direction, just need to hear from you. And those are good yearnings. And we ask, Lord, that those would be the kind of yearnings we have this evening. We're thankful that you're a God that meets 
those yearnings. And we look to you for that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Turn to 638, please. 638. One thing I would encourage us to think about in this one is our dedication and loyalty are not to our heritage, not to our fathers, as it says here. It says we will be true to thee till death. I think thee should be capitalized, right? Our loyalty is to Christ. We don't owe anything to those that have gone before, but we do to Christ. In him we live and have our being. Faith of our fathers, 638. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy. Whene'er we hear that glorious word, faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Our fathers chained in prisons dark, were still in heart and conscience free. Lord, grant their children strength and love like them to live and die for Thee. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death. Faith of our fathers, we will love both friend and foe in all our strife and preach thee to as love knows how thy kindly words and virtuous life faith of our fathers holy faith we will be true to thee till death Back a few pages to 614, 614. Good question to ask ourselves. Are you happy in the service of the king? Is it a joy to serve him? Being honest, not every day is joyful. But what about on average? Do you round up or round down? 614. I am happy in the service of the King. I am happy, oh so happy. I have peace and joy that nothing else can bring in the service of the King. In the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. I am happy in the service of the King. 
I am happy, oh so happy. Through the sunshine and the shadow I can sing in the service of the King. In the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. I am happy in the service of the King. I am happy, oh so happy. To his guiding hand forever I will cling. In the service of the King. In the service of the King. Every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. I am happy in the service of the King. I am happy, oh so happy. All that I possess to him I gladly bring in the service of the King. In the service of the King, every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. <clears throat> Amen. Don't have anything announcements this evening other than what we had this morning. Kids Compass Thursday, and then looking ahead a bit, Deacon's Meeting December 14th, which will be three Thursdays, I think, from now, or something like that. All right. Reed, would you mind taking our offering for us this evening, sir? And lead us in prayer. about All right, while uh, the boys are getting, uh, running around getting their mics ready, we will uh, prepare for any scriptures, testimonies, songs, anything like that. On thir Thanksgiving uh, supper we had here, we were limited in thanking the Lord for things about him. I'm not limited to that tonight, and I wanted to say I'm thankful for Han. Uh, tremendous blessing. I remember when I was a kid, not that much of a kid, a kid to me now because I'm old. Um, I, think I, I think I was talking to mom or something. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm not looking for the one that is talking about in Proverbs 31. I want the one that made him change from price above ruby to a plural, right? Where there's a bunch of them, okay? Not just one, not just her price is above a ruby, but a bunch of them. And uh, I'm just thankful for the way the Lord has worked 
and uh, continues to work. I still feel inadequate and hopefully always will. As soon as you start feeling like, yeah, she deserves me, look out. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Anybody else? I could go on for a while. Yes. Hang on just a second. You don't have a voice yet. There oh, we I'm go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Psalm 100, verse 2 it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. So, could we sing on the opposite page of the one we just sung, 615? 615. Any particular verse? They are all good. So, we'll sing um, uh, verse 1. All right. Joy in serving Jesus, 615. There is joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way. Joy that fills my heart with praises every hour and every day. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus, joy that throbs within my heart. Every moment, every hour, as I draw upon his power, there is joy, joy, joy that never shall depart. Who's next? Oh, we got hands up all over the place. I think Reed edged everyone else out just by a hair. I'm thankful that Mom will get her winter tires on soon. That's been a big deal today, hasn't it? Kind of our theme. Yeah, that's good. Next, uh, Rowena, you had your hand up. I thought, didn't you? Somebody did. Was it you, Graham? Nobody. So, you, well, uh, this is like an auction. Okay, one little flicker, and I'm going to pick you out. Was it you, Brittany? Okay, that should be noticeable. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a lot to be thankful for. Um, just being here tonight is Amen. a huge blessing and an answer to prayer. Um, if I were to share all of the ways that the Lord worked in the last six months for my sister, for her family, for myself, I think we would be here for a few weeks, <laughs> steady, just talking. Um, and I wish that I could have written down so many of the things that I've seen the Lord do. Um, I will say, you know, if you are truly hoping that the Lord would increase your faith and you pray that way, you better watch out. <laughs> yes. Buckle up, because yeah. it's quite a ride sometimes. But the yeah. Lord knows best and is always good. Um, and has proven himself over and over and over. And I've learned a lot through this process, as I'm sure my sister has and the family. And I've learned a lot from the children, too. Um, their faith has really helped and encouraged me and been a challenge to me. Um, my sister-in-law sent a verse one day, and we had lots of verses coming in. It was super helpful. She sent Jeremiah 32. Uh, let's see. 27, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Mm. And I wrote that on the whiteboard on Laura's refrigerator. And the day after, I'm like, hey, who wrote on my verse? And there was this big word, N-O. Is there anything too hard for me? And Mitchell had come along and written, no. <laughs> and I was like, okay, thank the Lord. He, he know, he's right. Amen. And then Adeline at one point prayed, you know, dear Lord, we thank you that God can do everything. And it's like, that's right. God can do everything. He can get us through every day. Yeah. Um, and he has. And it's just been a huge blessing to see how the Lord has worked. And I just praise him for it. Amen. Amen. Praise his name and keep praying. 433. All right. 433. Show me thy way, O Lord. Particular verse, Rowena, or just pick one or two? One and two, okay. Here we go. I wasn't telling you to pick one and two. I was just, here we go. Show 
Show me thy way, O Lord, and make it plain. I would obey thy word, speak yet again. I would not take one step until I know which way it is that you want me to go. O Lord, I cannot see, grant me thy light. Darkness bewilders me, clouding my sight. Hold thou my hand and keep close by my side. I dare not go alone, be thou my guide. <clears throat> Read. Can we say, oh, the four? Yep, what number is it? 633, okay. We'll sing the first verse. We shouldn't have to look it up. <coughs> Here we go. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signals still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace, we will. Amen. The signals that God gives that he is coming uh, are not necessarily ones we want to see. <laughs> uh, as we get closer to his return and he's signaling, hold the fort, I'm coming, uh, doesn't necessarily make lives better. <laughs> but <clears throat> we see it that way. It's good. Anybody else? Tyler. 186. And can it be? First verse okay, Ty? Okay, here we go. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued amazing love how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? We've had a request for verse 4 as well. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I walk. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amen. 
amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amen. Jake. I'm thankful it was a nice day. Yes, sir. Can we sing 187? 187, Amazing Grace. Verse 1. Verse 1, you sure can. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. T'was blind, but now I see. We've got time for more testimonies. One more hymn. Seth. I'm thankful for how God's worked in our lives. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk with one of my coworkers who has gone through uh, similar family events in the last month or so that I've been through. And we've compared notes. And he's not saved. His wife's not saved. And I'm really thankful for how God has worked in our situation. In every case has been caring and kind for me and has given me hope, which he hasn't had, and tried to encourage him and offer it to him, but short of, of God, he doesn't have any hope. He's not right. going to. And um, you can tell him that, and sometimes he can see it, sometimes he can't. But anyway, I'm just thankful for how God's worked in, in my life, just down to silly little details of giving me things for, for joy in my life that really don't matter in the long run, but just things that make my day fun and Amen. have been good in the last week. Could we sing um, 184? 184. We'll sing this hymn before we have our, our message this evening. Anyone else have scriptures or testimonies they wanted to share? This will be our final hymn. Read. It was a nice day today. It was a very nice day today. Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> kind of a common theme. Uh, 2023 was not an, a, a, an excellent year in terms of stuff happening, right? But it can work together for good to those that love God. To Brittany's point, right, at some point you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm happy with the amount of faith that I've got. I think I'm just going to hold it here for a little bit. I don't want to need anything else uh, <laughs> coming along. Um, and, uh, but the Lord knows how much to send. Um, I don't, that being said, I don't think it's a rebellious spirit that prays for a break, Right? Lord, can you help me? You see that through the Psalms, too. You know, he knows, but at the same time, he knows how to send us little things, like Seth said, but has, it has been tough on a lot of different people. Um, and I'm praying that the next year, the Lord would use what he taught us to increase his work and our outreach for him see some fruit from the labor. Anybody else? Amen. Yes. Anybody else? Rachel. For what? Your bear? Oh, I heard about the bear. That's pretty special, isn't it? Yeah, thank the Lord. That's good. I'm thankful for the um, generosity of each one here in the church. I 
sometimes you, I don't, when I start looking around and I think, I realize how much we have that has been given to us. And I think about from the clothes for the kids, I think, wow, that's an awesome, you know, coat or whatever. And it's like, I didn't pay anything for that. Somebody gave it to us. And then f um, shoes or, you know, I get s look in my freezer and I'm like, oh, wow, that's ve vegetables. I didn't do anything for that. Somebody gave that to us. And it's like, I'm just so thankful for just the generosity and stuff for ev everybody here at the church. Not bad. Thank the Lord for his provision, right? Any other takers? Nope. Okay. We're slamming the door on this. 184. Hallelujah. What a Savior. <clears throat> That's the one you had, right, Seth? Okay. Don't be muttering, Hallelujah. What a Savior. You don't have to leap for joy, but you should at least smile. 184, let's stand. But you can if you want. Dad showed us how the other day. Yeah, keep going. You're ruining the mood. Okay, here we go. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. All atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring. I knew this song will sing, hallelujah, what a Savior. Jim, I thought you were going to run the aisle for a second. I said, he's off, uh, but it wasn't quite that way. <laughs> Amen. Please be seated. Well, tonight we're going to start 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's read the first six verses. Won't take you long to pick up that the topic has changed again. Things move along, don't they? Well, there's a lot going on in that church. Not all of it good, but... I think Matt said sometimes church, God's work is messy work. <laughs> and so he has messy people, doesn't he, that he has to work with. And it takes some messy work to, to clean up <laughs> messy people. It takes a little bit of scrubbing sometimes. And so we got some other things going on in the church. And, and Paul here is, is going to, uh, through the Spirit of God, start to address this next thing. Am I not... An apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? 
Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord in Cephas? Or I only in Barnabas, have, we not, have not we power to forbear working? All right, well, we'll see what it is that was the problem here and, and uh, maybe get some good practical lessons for ourselves in the process. Father, thank you for the time we have this evening. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, that you have given your word and uh, there's so many uh, problems that are addressed here in the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're thankful for that in a, in a strange sort of way that they had problems because we have similar problems and issues ourselves. And it's good to know how these, what your will is concerning these. So give us understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. What was going on here? as well in the church of Corinth. Well, let me put it this way. Did Paul face opposition outside of the church of Christ by the unsaved, by the Jewish religious leaders, by maybe uh, some in uh, Gentile government? Yeah, it was, Paul was pretty much accustomed to getting opposition from outside the church, and he got his share of it and more. But this is a different problem. Paul uh, was facing some opposition from within Christianity, from within the church of Christ. And this uh, to him was more hurtful, actually, than what was going on outside of the church and the public opposition that he had outside of the church. And what was going on internally was the questioning of whether or not he was called of God to be an apostle. And others in the, within Christianity and within the church were starting to question his authority as an apostle and therefore starting to question what he was teaching and the instruction that he was giving. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. And the doctrine that he was uh, giving to them because there were some in the church that didn't like what they were hearing. They didn't like the, the things that they heard. And one of the ways to, to hinder that and to maybe get that to change is try to go at the, the messenger, which in this case happened to be Paul. And to go after Paul, they went after whether or not he was called to be an apostle or not. I tell you, it can be kind of discouraging, can't it? When those that you love and, and have worked hard for start to question whether or not you're called of God to the ministry that you're involved in. When you know for a fact you are called of God to that work and to that ministry. And so no doubt this was kind of a discouraging thing for Paul. They were trying, there was uh, people that were getting very industrious and in finding ways to lessen his character and to sink his reputation. And this was going on in the church of Corinth. There were some in the church of Corinth that had picked up this and were starting to question. A little mumbling here and a little mumbling, oh, you know, I'm not really sure uh, that Paul was called to be an apostle, are you? You know, I've, I've heard him say some things and you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to persuade you anything, but I'm just questioning you know, whether he's really called to be apostle. You know, maybe you ought to think about that a little bit. And this kind of undercurrent going on in the church. Uh, uh, undercurrents are not healthy for a church. And uh, this is one of the things going on there in Corinth. Ultimately, our battle is not with men. It's good to be reminded of that. Uh, this was a satanic effort because obviously Satan was opposed to the things that God was doing through Paul's ministry. 
And it was trying to, different techniques and different tactics to, to interfere with that. And so this was an effort to cause those who heard him to question his teaching and his doctrine. And getting this from people that professed Christ was very disheartening to Paul. Paul previously spoke uh, concerning his uh, thoughts on this from chapter 4 in this book, in verse 3, where he said, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. I tell you, when it comes right down to it, it doesn't matter what people think. All that matters is the Lord and what he thinks. Because in the end, we must all answer to God. We're not going to answer to any man. We're going to answer to the Lord. And it's important that things be right with the Lord, and that the work I'm doing is the work that God has called me to do, or you to do, whatever the case may be. Uh, how important is it to know that God has called you to ministry. Very, very important. In fact, it's absolutely necessary. Because uh, as a believer, you're going to encounter various difficulties. You're going to encounter uh, various problems and trials and struggles. And it's going to cause you maybe to question, is it, should I really be doing this? Is this, uh, is this something the Lord really wants me to be doing? And unless you know that God has called you to do it, you may very well quit and cave. It's so important to know that God has called you to the ministry that you're involved in, whatever that may be. I know that the Lord is, wants me doing this. And, and to get that settled to the, before the Lord. There have been instances in the past where men were called not of God. They were called of men. And I'm not going to use any names this evening, but I do remember a man coming to our service years ago and uh, in talking with him. He said that he had been a pastor of a church, but <coughs> he said, I came to realize that my calling was not from God, it was from men. And he said, I gave it up. Well, that, that's some uh, credibility right there, and there's some objectivity of a man with himself to be able to real realize, I, am, I was not called of God to this. I, my calling was of men. And if my calling is on men, I have no business doing this. I need to step down. But praise the Lord for that humility where he could recognize that and, and do that. Sometimes that is the case. It could be a calling of men. And it can be a calling of ourselves. We call ourselves to it. <laughs> Why would we do that? Well, oftentimes because there is a very evident need and we, we really feel pretty strongly in our hearts of that need. We say, well, somebody's got to fill it. I guess I better fill it. <laughs> but, you know, that's different than knowing that God called me to do it. There are many needs out there, and there are very many important needs out there. And God has somebody to, for each of those needs, but he hasn't called you to fulfill all the needs that there are out there. There is something specific God does want you to do, though. And it's important to know what that is that God wants you to do. There are other instances where a man is indeed called of God, such as Paul was into the ministry. And trials came and difficulties arose. And men questioned, men questioned his calling. And I tell you, sometimes that can start shaking your feet a little bit and start you wondering in yourself, did God call me to this or not? Well, in those instances, you better be able to go back in your mind and know God did call me. 
and say, yeah, this is what God wanted me to do. I, I know men are questioning it, but it doesn't matter. I am sure in my own self, God has called me to do that. It is possible to be judged of men falsely, and that happens too on occasion. I'll tell you, without God's call, men will give up eventually. It is that assurance of God's call that enables a person to stick with it and to keep going. No matter how tough the going gets, God is able. If God calls, He is your strength. He is your ability to get through it. He is your wisdom. He's everything you need to sustain anything that can come against you in that ministry. <clears throat> Without that, we will give up. You look down through Scripture and you can see it over and over again. You might ask, what was it that kept Joshua going into battle again and again and again against these various cities and, and strongholds of the Canaanites? It was God's have not I commanded thee. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. When you got that from God, you can take any battle that comes your way. Because he says, have not I commanded thee. I sent you. And he says, you don't need to be afraid, you don't need... You can be of good courage. You don't need to be dismayed. <coughs> For I am with thee whithersoever thou goest. What about Moses? Oh, those words. I am hath sent me. <coughs> I am. The great I am. Whatever you need, I am. That God has sent me. Oh, he could go back to that. How many times would he have gone back to that? And all of the difficulties and trials throughout that wilderness. All the opposition and questioning of the people of Israel. Oh, you've drawn us out here into the wilderness to die. God hasn't called you. Who, who do you think you are that God's called you? He could have called one of us. And yet he says, I am has sent me. And he had that settled in his own heart and mind. He could go back to that. What about David? Oh, those words, arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is he. All oh, his troubles being a king, and he had his share of them. But those words, arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is who I have selected to be king. Those words from God. And we think of Ezekiel. A lot of things he faced as well. But he said, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman over the, unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. He had that from God himself. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. That kept Ezekiel going. It is the very presence of God that gives strength to keep going when human strength, human wisdom, and motivation run out. And I'll tell you, you will run out. Moses realized this. In Exodus 33, 14, he says, The Lord said to Moses, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And this is what Moses responded unto him. If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. If you're not going to go with me, I can't go. I'm not going to go. Don't, don't lead me someplace where your presence is not going to be there with me. And I can praise the Lord, and we can all praise the Lord. He never leaves, leads us to a place. He doesn't lead us to a place. 
that his presence is not there. Thank the Lord for, for his presence. It is his presence that gives us strength to keep going. When our human strength and human wisdom and our motivation just give out. For Paul, it was God's words there, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. But you know, I believe uh, the scripture is pretty clear that that Paul was aware of what God had called him to before that, is just at this time is when the Lord made it clear to the church to separate him out for that ministry. What does he say? That I have called him to. I think Paul was aware of the calling that God had called him to, but he was waiting for God to move and to make the church aware and have the church set him apart for that ministry that God had called him to. How do we, what makes us think this? Well, Galatians 1, 15 to 17 says, but when it pleased God, Paul is saying to the Galatians here, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia. He went into the desert and returned again unto Damascus. Why did he go into the desert? He needed to know from the Lord what it was God was calling him to do. He wanted to get that settled before the Lord. He said, I, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Okay, so Paul uh, had it upon his conscience, the Holy Spirit placing it upon his conscience that I am called you by my grace to reveal my son in you and to have you preach him among the heathen, among the Gentiles. For a man that was steeped in Judaism and Phariseeism, that would, may have been a hard pill for him to swallow, that this is what God had called him to do. Oh, the Gentiles! Are you kidding me? I can't, I can't imagine that you would have me do that. Can that really be of you, God? He probably struggled with this. He had to get it settled in his own heart and mind. I'll tell you, there's only one that could settle it, and that was God himself. Oh, could he have gone into the, to the, into the church in Jerusalem and, and gone up to Brother uh, Jim and said, well, what do you think? Uh, you know, do you think the Lord has called me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles? Well, yeah, I do. I think, okay, yes. And he goes to, to Brother Blaine. He goes, what do you think? You think the Lord's called me into the ministry? No. Okay, yes and no. And he could do a tally and come up with three yeses and maybe two noes. Okay, well, the Lord must have called me into the ministry. Then I had three yeses and two noes from men. That's not going to be enough to do it. It's not going to hold up. These are just opinions of men. It's not the call of God. Well, you know, uh, Peter, James, and John, the apostles, oh, yes, I'll go and confer with them. These are men of God. Uh, these are people who have been with Jesus Christ. They know the will of God. They know the word of God. These men have traveled with Jesus Christ. Certainly, they will know if God has called me into full-time ministry. He goes, Peter, James, and John. And he might get, yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, the Lord has called me then. All three of the apostles think I'm called of God to do this. That is not the call of God. As godly a men as they were, godly men cannot call you into the ministry. It has to be God himself. And that's why he said, I, didn't, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I didn't get, do a poll, see what everybody thought. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. I didn't ask them. But I went into Arabia. Went into the desert. He needed to get it settled between him and God. I bet he spent a lot of time searching those Old Testament scriptures. Saying, Gentiles, Gentiles, how does this work? 
Could God have a plan for Gentiles? And as he searched the scriptures, he said, yes, he did. God has a plan. And all the pictures started to come together. He could see the work of God in his present day. And he had the blessing of knowing God called me to do that today. Then he went home and told everybody he could think of, God's called me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. No, he didn't. Kept his mouth shut. Why? He needed to know God was convincing the church that this is what he had called him to. And one day, the Lord spoke to the church and said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the ministry I have called them to. And then the church knew. And those two things came together, and that was a confirmation from God himself, and God confirming it to the church that sent him out, that this is my calling from God, I have no doubt about it. That's the kind of thing you need when you're called of God into ministry, to hold you there. What are we left with if we don't have that? Well, you're left to your own devices, your own strength. But I'll tell you, that's not going to do it. That's not going to cut it in God's work. Because God's work has to be done by God himself. You may be an instrument in it. He may be able to use you as well as other people in it. But it is God that does the work. And if you try to do it without God... The only thing you're left with is your own devices and your own strength and your own work and your own wisdom. And that's not going to do it. You need God himself. Well, I think one of the things that was maybe as Paul wrote this, and this was kind of introductory to these verses, I know, but as Paul was penning these things and, and we read in those first few verses of chapter 9, you kind of get a sense here of, of, a, of an ingratitude by these in Corinth, these believers, toward Paul. And, and that, I think, was particularly difficult for Paul to bear upon his own heart. You kind of get a sense for, the, for a little bit of hurt in the heart of Paul as we go through these verses. We read things like, If I be not an apostle unto others... Yet doubtless I am to you. You know, isn't there a little bit of, you're special to me. And I, I ought to be special to you. There's something between us that, that should leave you with no doubt that I have been called to be an apostle. Well, um, it seems like a little bit of ingratitude there. And I'll say this, there are some times that, that discrediting and opposition are best ignored. It may be the better part of wisdom just to ignore it and, and not make issues about it. But there are other times that maybe it ought to be responded to. But I'll tell you, the motive for responding makes, the, makes a huge difference. And what is it that you're trying to defend? Is it your own reputation? Is it a personal self-defense because you've been personally affronted? Are you doing this and responding out of pride and out of, out of flesh? A desire to set the record straight. And for some gratification from that, <laughs> it showed them. <laughs> I'll tell you, all those motives are not the right motive. And that's not the motive that Paul has here when we read these verses. I'm kind of prepping us for that. That is simply a defense of myself. And um, I'll tell you this, that so many issues that arise in the church of Christ have a way of digressing down to personal affronts. It gets to be a personal attack 
against one and personal attack against the other. It's almost like the main issue gets lost because everybody's so busy personally attacking each other that they can't even remember what they're fighting over anymore. I'm fighting because of what you said about me. <laughs> and I'm fighting because of what you said about me. And there's, the letters start going back and forth. The words start going back and forth. Animosities build and build and build. And the temperature rises and rises and rises. And you stop and think, what was the issue here? You can't even, it kind of gets lost in the kerfluffle. Well, that is more of flesh than it is of the Spirit of God, isn't it? And some of that is because of approaching this as a personal affront. But there can be a right motive in defending uh, things that are spoken against, uh, maybe against you as a, as a believer or as a minister of the Lord or involved in ministry. This is what's at stake. It wasn't the reputation of Paul that he's concerned about. The problem here is, if these folks are successful in saying, I'm not an apostle, that is to say that all these things given to me by God are not trustworthy. And it starts to undermine the message that God has given it starts to undermine the Word of God. And what's at stake here is the Word of God to an, a fledgling church that needs to be established in the Word of God. And the, God has called me to, to lay the foundation for the church of God. And if they are successful in eroding the apostleship, my apostleship, they're going to be successful in eroding the foundational truths that God is using to build his church today. And so he said there's much more at stake here than just my own reputation. And he, for that reason, he is defending his apostleship really for the sake of, of God's word, God's truth, and the stability of that church and, and the other churches. And it wasn't for personal pride's sake. It was in defense of God's plan for the church and for God's plan that the gospel go to the Gentiles and God's plan of how that church would be built and, and uh, the doctrines and, and, and principles involved in that and God's process of doing this. All of this was at stake if they could successfully attack whether or not Paul was called to be an apostle. So there's more at stake here than Paul's pride. Ephesians 2.20, Paul uh, uh, writes there about them and about the church of Christ, which are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. All right, so the, the apostles were foundational and laying the foundation for the early church their teaching and so forth. The Lord used them in that capacity. 1 Corinthians 3.10, back a little bit, he says, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. There are others that were building on that foundation, but he said, I have laid the foundation, others have built thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. All right. So what is at stake here is the very foundational things that God had, had called him to get established there in the local churches. And the Spirit of God now, through Paul, speaks to address those things that would distract from the Christian ministry and from the work that God was doing at that time. And this is the first distraction. I look at this uh, chapter and see uh, basically three uh, distractions going on that can happen in Christian ministry. We're going to touch the first one next time. It is doubting God's call. We've pretty much started that tonight. That's, that can distract somebody from their ministry if others start doubting a call. The second thing is working in my own strength 
and for personal glory. That will take distract from the ministry, from what God is doing. And the third one is just plain apathy. Apathy. Uh, losing the care, losing the interest, and saying, eh, I don't really care. Apathy. I, I think these three things start to show up as we go through the chapter, and hopefully be an encouragement to us not to get distracted from the the work that God has called us to. Father, thank you for the work that you're doing, the work you started back there in those early days of the church. And we're thankful for the fruit that it has produced uh, down through the centuries. We're thankful that you are working today in your church and you're still calling men into ministries. You're, there are ministries for each one in the church. And it's your business to... to uh, direct your servants into the ministries you would have them doing. And I pray that each one of us, as we would engage in ministries, would get it settled that this is what God wants me to do. And then uh, see you be as sufficient uh, in those ministries. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing uh, 609, 609 to close with. <coughs> let's sing one, three, and four. Okay, let's stand together and sing one, three, and four. Savior, my dying love, Thou gavest me, nor should I aught withhold, Some need of kindness done, some wonder sought and won, some think for thee. All that I am and have, thy gift so free. on your part that we can be anything for you. We're thankful for your grace that can work to make our service productive and make it of benefit in your overall plan. We're thankful that you have chosen us to work through in your plan and to include us in your plan. And just ask, Lord, that our, our association with thee would be so close that we can know what your plan is for us 
and be actively involved in it and see how sufficient you are to meet our needs. So we commit our time and our day, our week to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.